Okay, so moving on then uh, with Gravity's Rainbow, we are uh, still in part one, uh, up to episode 12 now. Um, this is page 74 in the Penguin edition. Uh, this is the Penguin edition that we're going through. And then, um, so Pynchon introduces us now to the operation known as the White Visitation, uh, which is being run by one Brigadier General Pudding. Uh, the names are a little bit, they remind me a bit of the names in uh, Stanley Kubrick's film, Dr. Strangelow, uh, General Buck Turgidson and so forth. Uh, Pynchon has a similar sense of humor to Kubrick, I think. Um, so the White Visitation was set up in an abandoned uh, mental hospital, naturally, of course, because it's, I'm sure it's regarded by uh, a vast portion of the military as a collection of kooks who are all studying uh, psychic abilities. Um, but there are two divisions, actually, as far as I can tell, there are two. Um, on the one hand are the classical conditioning people, the behaviorists, um, led by Pointsman. Um, and his program is called, uh, the acronym for it is ARF, uh, the App Reaction Research Facility. Uh, they're studying dogs, remember? <laughs> classically conditioning dogs. So uh, on one side of the uh, room is the, the the ARF people and the kennels with the dogs. And then on the other side is the Pisces group who are all in psyops and they're all studying the paranormal. Uh, Pynchon mentions them doing the cards that J.B. Ryan did, uh, guessing the, the packs of groups of five, 25 cards. Uh, you do 25 cards in groups of five and uh, you guess whether they're waves, crosses, stars, whatever. Um, so that's the setup with the white visitation. And now they're uh, beginning to talk about Tyrone Slothrop. Um, and what they want to do is expose him to a special type of test called a projective test. And uh, there's a doctor here. His name is uh, Dr. Rosa Volge. Uh, Dr. Rosa Volge who has very funny speech patterns, um, who is, is, gives the example for the best type of projective test uh, is the, the ink blot, the Rorschach test, um, where you have an unstructured stimulus. And the thing about classical conditioning is that it's very linear, linear as we have seen, very cause and effect, and you have a very structured stimulus. Um, but with a, a projective test, like a Rorschach test, the stimulus is of, cord, is of course a card with an ink blot on it. And depending on the person's psychology, they'll see different things in that ink blot. Some people might see a demon. Other people might see, I don't know, a cloud or a face staring back at them or whatever it is. Uh, but it's, that's an example of a projective test. But it turns out, or it will turn out, that the projective test will actually be to expose Slothrop to the octopus named Grigory, uh, whom we had seen previously that they, uh, they had assigned to Pointsman to classically condition, whereas uh, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't very thrilled about the assignment because he wants a human. Um, and Kevin Spectro over at St. Veronica's Hospital uh, was studying uh, what he called foxes. His foxes are his patients, uh, patients with PTSD. Um, so this is what the plan is, is to, uh, they're on his case and uh, they, they want to expose him to this octopus, which we won't see, I think, until uh, part two, uh, right at the beginning. And um, so then in episode 13 now, we have the situation with, uh, we learn about how Dr. Laszlo Yamf uh, was the one who classically conditioned Tyrone Slothrop. And he's famous within the field already for being known as Infant Slothrop, um, where on the model of Infant Albert, uh, which was the child back in the 1920s, was it? That uh, the behaviorist couple, um, Watson, and Rainer, I think it's Rosalie Weisenberger has their names in here as, what is it? Uh, John B. Watson and his wife, Rosalie uh, Watson, were the parents of behavioral psychology. Um, and their 1918 conditioning of their 11 month old child uh, named Baby Albert founded the, the, the pathetic, in my opinion, and disreputable field of behaviorism and what they did, uh, these parents are scumbags. I, I don't care whether the research was funded or financed or whatever, they're, they're scumbags. So they have an 11-year-old baby 
and they put toy animals, furry animals, stuffed animals into the crib with the child. And then behind the child's head, uh, every time they put the animals in, they bang on a steel bar in a, in a very loud, terrifying way that ups, is very upsetting to the child. So once you remove that stimulus, which is a, a very structured stimulus, you remove that stimulus, and now with the child, uh, every time it sees one of these furry animals, uh, it gets upset. Uh, and not only that, but it developed, um, it, it got upset whenever it saw anything furry uh, at all. Um, supposedly the child was later deconditioned, but uh, um, <laughs> now significantly it is, uh, at the beginning here, it's General Pudding, who's the only one who raises questions about the ethics of this. Uh, with the opening dialogue between him and Pointsman, where Pudding says, but isn't this, and Pointsman says, sir, um, Pudding says, isn't it all rather shabby, Pointsman, meddling with another man's mind this way? Then Pointsman says, Brigadier, we're only following in a long line of experiment and questioning. Harvard University, the U.S. Army, hardly shabby institutions. Pudding says, we can't, Pointsman, it's beastly. And then Pointsman, but the Americans have already been at him. Don't you see? It's not as if we're corrupting a virgin or something. Then Pudding says, do we have to do it because the Americans do it? Must we allow them to corrupt us? And he's the only one who raises objections uh, to the ethics of what they were planning to do with Slothrop, which is to find him and uh, recondition him, or at least find out what the connection is with the rockets that are coming in and the fact that he gets a hard on uh, before has a sexual conquest and then the rockets come in a few days later, uh, anywhere between two to ten days later. So we learn that he was classically conditioned as infant Tyrone uh, in 1920 by Dr. Laszlo Yanf, whom we had already seen was an employee of Agfa. And uh, so what he decided to do, and by the way, uh, Pynchon mentions here uh, Kekule, who um, moved into architecture moved out of the field of architecture into organic chemistry in the 19th century as a parallel to Dr. Yamf, who also has moved later in his career into organic chemistry. And of course, Kekulé founded organic chemistry by having a vision of uh, a serpent biting its tail. And that vision became, it gave him the key to the structure of the benzene ring, which is in, in the shape of a ring. Um, so note there that unlike the Rorschach blot test that um, Dr. Rosavolgi was talking about, here we have pattern recognition that is correct and that yields results. It was the correct structure. So there was an isomorphism between the image that Kekulé saw and that he projected onto the structure of the benzene ring and then founded the whole field of organic chemistry that gave us all kinds of dyes and plastics and bizarre things that are poisoning our, our bodies, colors like mauve, um, and that IG Farben is a purveyor of the German firm that is a huge purveyor of. So that's the contrast because one of the main themes, as we've seen all along here in Pynchon, is pattern recognition versus paranoia. Uh, when we're seeing patterns, let's say uh, you're a philosopher constructing a, a meta history, you're Oswald Spengler writing The Decline of the West, and you, you were seeing civilizations as basically giant plants with predetermined life cycles. Now, is that a, a correct pattern recognition like Kekulé's structure for the benzene ring? Um, is there an isomorphism there between Spengler's uh, pattern and what actually is the case in history, which I, I believe actually there is? Um, or is it the case of paranoia's pattern recognition gone awry, uh, where you talk, listen to a schizophrenic for two minutes and it doesn't even sound like they're speaking English. They've made all kinds of paranoid connections um, there's a camera in my pen that's, you know, every time I use it, the camera clicks on, you know, it's just pattern recognition gone awry. And so it's very important to keep that in mind here because that's what, um, and Pynchon never resolves, he never comes down on one side or the other. This is post-modernity, which is casting a very skeptical eye on grand historical meta narratives of any kind. Um, so that's what Pynchon's up to here. So they're talking about now what Yamf did uh, and I'll describe this here. He doesn't say what the age of Tyrone was at the time, but he was pretty young. And he, he's, Pynchon writes, um, the thing about the, the couple who classically conditioned infant Albert 
is that they're, as far as YAMF is concerned, uh, they were studying something vague. Uh, yes, studying the dogs and the, the amount of saliva that they uh, salivate is precise and can be measured, uh, but, the, but he wants to study a human subject, like uh, Pointsman does, and uh, condition a human subject, and what the couple was doing is studying fear. Uh, but fear is vague, he thinks. I mean, who, who says how much fear is involved, uh, when it hits, what, you know, what's a fearful response? It's too vague for him. So he focuses on uh, Tyrone's penis, and uh, it doesn't say here what the stimulus is, because that's one of the book's central, uh, let's say, MacGuffin's uh, central mysteries uh, that we're trying to find out here. It's an unspecified stimulus, which is most likely the polymer that he has invented uh, called Imipolex G. Um, and Pynchon writes, um, but a hard on that's either there or it isn't. Binary, elegant. The job of, of uh, observing it can even be done by a student. Unconditioned stimulus equals stroking penis with antiseptic cotton swab. Unconditioned response, hard on. Conditioned stimulus equals X at this point. We don't, nobody knows what the stimulus was in the field that Yamp used to condition a slothrop. Conditioned response equals hard on whenever X is present. Uh, stroking is no longer necessary. All you need is that X. You can get rid of the, stimula the stimulus and uh, just in the presence of that X, whatever it is, Imipolix G is in the rockets. And so there's some, some way in which uh, it's causing these sexual conquests. Uh, but they don't know that, that it is Imipolix G yet. Um, and so they're talking about here about the, the point of Beyond the Zero, which is the title for this section, um, now, ordinarily, according to tradition in these matters, the little sucker would have been deconditioned. Uh, Yamf would have, in Pavlovian terms, extinguished the hard-on reflex he built up before he let the baby go. Most likely he did, but as Ivan Petrovich himself said, and this is a direct quote from one of the Pavlovian books, not only must we speak of partial or of complete extinction of a conditioned reflex, but we must also realize that extinction can proceed beyond the point of reducing a reflex to zero. We cannot therefore judge the degree of extinction only by the magnitude of the reflex or its absence, since there can still be a silent extinction beyond the zero. So that's what the, uh, the title refers to of this section, beyond the zero, the, the removal of the response, whatever it disappears. But it can go beyond the zero, but the absence of, uh, let's say the hard on in this case, um, it can go beyond the zero then into an inversion. So what's the inversion becomes the, the question here. So now they're theorizing about, uh, in the white visitation, various individuals have different theories about what, what Slothrop is doing here. Um, and Roger Mexico just, of course, thinks it's a statistical anomaly somehow. Uh, but he feels the foundations of that discipline trembling a bit now. Um, <laughs> Not very likely that his, he would have sexual conquest, and every time he has one, he puts a star on his distribution map with a date uh, handily for the conquest so that they, they can correlate it. And they've made, uh, from Teddy Bloat's photographs, uh, they've made uh, an exact correlation between the distribution map of where the rockets did hit that they know of, and then the stars for the sexual conquests and the dates, and they match precisely. Um, so there's a very, a very precise uh, connection that statistics just wouldn't account for. Rollo Grost thinks it's precognition. Uh, somehow Slothrop is able to predict when a rocket will fall in a particular place. Um, and then Edwin Treacle uh, thinks it's psychokinesis. Maybe Slothrop is actually causing these rockets to fall. Somehow um, he's, he's bringing them in. And they theorize, well, why would he do that? And uh, one of them says, well, maybe he hates women. Uh, because chances are, uh, if he leaves an area, the rocket lands, uh, the woman that he had sex with might be killed in the rocket strike. Um, so then uh, Roger Mexico goes out for a walk with pointsmen, and they get into one of their philosophical debates regarding uh, the issue of causality, cause and effect versus statistical probability. And... Um, uh, Roger says, Pointsman, what if Edwin Treacle is right? 
that it's PK, uh, psychokinesis. What if Slothrop's not even consciously making them fall where they do? Well, you lot would have something fun then, wouldn't you? But why should he? If they're falling wherever he's been, perhaps he hates women. I'm serious. Mexico, are you actually worried? I don't know. Perhaps I wondered if it might tie in in any way with your ultra-paradoxical phase. Perhaps I want to know what you're really looking for. And the ultra-paradoxical phase is, uh, as, um, as Pointsman goes on to describe, the three phases of classical conditioning, where the first phase is the equivalent phase in which we have the dog, let's say, uh, with the stimulus, uh, and the stimulus is producing an equivalent response with exactly the same number of drops of saliva each time. Then it moves into the paradoxical phase in which as the stimulus gets weaker or vice versa or gets stronger, let's say the stimulus gets stronger and there's, there's fewer drops of saliva or it can be the other way around. So then it begins to become nonlinear in that sense. Uh, and the, but then finally, the ultra paradoxical phase that Pointsman is referring to here is the phase where uh, it stops working altogether, no matter how strong the stimulus is. Uh, you turn on the metronome, uh, which would make the dog salivate without food being around, and now the dog doesn't salivate at all. Um, so then it becomes ultra paradoxical and then moves beyond the zero. Uh, so that's, that's the issue here. So they're debating over this. and. Um, Mexico says to him, what are you after? What is it that you're trying to do here? And he says, I just want to know what's going on with Slothrop. It's very important to me that we find a material basis, a mechanical explanation uh, for what he is doing uh, because it's so mysterious and he wants to know. He's a, he's a mechanist, a causal mechanist and a materialist. Um, and so that's basically the upshot of this chapter uh, in their conversation. And um, so then that moves us into uh, the next episode coming up here.